The history of the American westward migration is rife with legends. The rugged terrain and primitive transportation of the era combined to demand the finest from the brave men and women who dared inhabit its sun-cracked deserts or cross its snow-covered mountains. The men who chose to confront the harsh elements of the Old West became known as cowboys. Cowboys slept out under a star-filled sky cooked their meals of beans, salt pork, and black coffee over the open flames of a roaring campfire. They faced danger and uncertainty every moment of the day. They were men expected to perform their best under the most rigorous of conditions. In this century, Hollywood has provided us with the image we now associate with these brave men. In the early days of cinema, people flocked to the theater to catch the adventures of men like Tex Ritter, Gene Autry, and Roy Rogers. More recently, the movies have chosen to portray him as more of a politically correct drifter, a loner seeking redemption by virtue of his six-shooter. The true cowboy is a relic of the distant past, now relegated to rodeos, state fairs, and the Nashville network. The naysayers claim that there's no room in modern society for the cowboy and his rustic style, that this cultural displacement is a sad but inevitable byproduct of progress. Fortunately, there is an exception to this rule. sincerely out of his mind than anybody could ever have imagined. Yeah, it was kind of like he was real shy, but not shy at the same time. You know, once he, if he had something in his hand, if he had his guitar in his hand, he could knock a wall down, you know. That's better than the way he did it when he was down here. He carried a stamp, <laughs> a rubber stamp, and, a, and an ink pad. And if anybody asked him for an autograph, he just said, dang. And whatever you held out, he'd put it on there. He's not insane. He's not like dangerous or like mentally retarded. He's eccentric. A sound check. We uh, we're all setting up and everything, and the microphones are set up and. Uh... Norman just got up there with his bugle and just put it right in, into the microphone and just blasted out notes and the sound man was like, you know, running for the board to throw the faders down and Norman's going, you know, you want to check this thing, don't you? I mean, this is, the, this is really what it's all about, this horn here. <laughs> to come down there to our gigs and sometimes he would like bring his trumpet or something and and stand outside and play his trumpet he sat in with us a couple of times down there and that was the first time i really kind of got to know him and then i lost track of him and the next thing i knew he was he was on laugh-in <laughs> keeps up with, with definitely with, with what all the designers are doing out there in, in the world of fashion. And he's also big on weather.
Well, I think it's a cotton pick and smash. It's See? a hit. It's a hit. Oh, cotton pick and smash. Really? Yeah. yeah. Here, we, here we go. The song I wrote back in the early 60s in Lubbock, Texas. It's on the album, Rockin' the Scarlet. When I walk out into my backyard, the baby tracks me down like radar. I roll screens on my old patio. In the fall of 1968, Norman Carl Odom left his hometown of Lubbock, Texas and set out for New York City with the idea of becoming a guest on The Tonight Show. He lacked the business savvy of a good manager or the bargaining power of a booking agent. He didn't have a recording contract or a demo tape and was between guitars due to a mishap at a local drive-in. Despite these setbacks, and the fact that Norman's journey was prematurely brought to an end a mere 300 miles to the east, within the week he would record what was to become the most notorious record ever to enter the Billboard Top 200 charts. Before the end of the year, he would perform it on the number one television program in the country. Oh, I wanted to ask you about the, the Rebel Yell. Um, I wanted to ask you where you learned that. Back in 1960, I taught myself, you know, from watching Tarzan movies <laughs> on TV on Saturday morning. I could just belt those at you. You could hear them a half a mile away on a cool, clear, calm summer night back in Lubbock, Texas. You're from Lubbock. That's yeah. right. That's the only town in the United States named Lubbock. I thought maybe you could, is it possible, could, could you do it, or could you do a Rebel Yell here? That's a rebel yell. My name is the one and only legendary Stardust Cowboy, and I'm a singer, songwriter, dancer, and just a hoopty doo guy all around. I'm an actor. I've been in movies. I write poems. I play a guitar. I play a bugle. I play a rub board, a kazoo, and just about anything else I can play besides the radio. On Friday, September 5th, 1947, Norman Odom was born in Lubbock, Texas. I went to church every Sunday as I grew up on Flint Avenue, just south of the cotton fields. When I was six years old, I did not start school because I was not ready. Instead, I was sent to kindergarten in order for the teacher to get me to talk. It took her six months to get me to talk. When I was seven years old, I was walking down the street after school and told myself that someday I was going to be famous. How, when, or where, I did not know, but I knew that someday I was going to be famous. My parents uh, uh, allowed me to uh, start taking guitar lessons when I was 16. When I was 16, and uh, uh, so I took guitar lessons, you know, for about six months and learned how to play some basic guitar melodies. Then they tried to get me to sing, but I didn't start singing with my guitar playing until years later when I was about maybe 17 or 18 years old. Sang old Ray Price songs and Johnny Cash songs and Marty Robbins songs. Elvis Presley and Tom Jones were my big influences, big influences on me in the early days. Tried to imitate Elvis's dance, Tom Jones' dance. Came out with my own dance called the Cowboy Twist. That's what I brand all my dances as Cowboy Twist. And years later, back in 66, I got a bugle, Boy Scout bugle, bugle, chrome plated. Picked one up for 10 bucks, brand new. I started playing with uh, Herb Albert on his records. I used to play uh, Tijuana Taxi and Spanish Flea and, and several of his old hits, you know, play along with him. I got the, I got the right notes down. But then I'd get away from his records, his songs, her about her songs, and I would uh, start playing my own stuff, you know, innovating stuff. First time I saw Norman was uh, J.T. Hutchison Jr. in high school. Uh, he was playing on the steps, and he would get to school at about 7.30 in the morning before everybody else did, and uh, do a whole set before the bell rang. People would, oh, you know, like throw pennies and try to throw little peppermints into the hole of his guitar. Uh, and he played a lot. 
it just kind of it just kind of wail on the top of his lungs. I remember he played the Elvis Presley songs and uh, Everly Brothers songs, and they I think it was Everly Brothers. Songs. But anyway, they gradually started turning into his own songs. Uh, so I'd, I'd see like a some song like Hound Dog all of a sudden turn into Paralyzed through a kind of chain of events. Um, of course, I, we went to the same school uh, through like seventh, eighth, ninth grade, and then we went to the high school. And uh, Norman carried on the tr tradition there and played on the steps of the high school. I used to entertain around Bonnery High School, love of poor school, in the courtyard, out of the steps of the auditorium. People would honk their horns, people throw money, dirt clogs, and sweethearts at me. Some of the girls, you know, didn't like it because the boys were making fun of me. Some of the, uh, I get a crowd, big crowd, no time. Talk about a rip-roaring crowd and big fights going on. There's be my fans have been for me, they fighting the ones, pulling the ones off of me, they were against me and had like the guitar taken from me, taken away from me from the principal. Several times in high school I almost got kicked out because of that. I was threatened. One time I was I had my guitar with me. Uh, I was standing I was standing on a toilet in the bathroom entertaining some guys. A biology biology teacher walked in. Grabbed my guitar and took me down to the principal's office. And the principal's name was Floyd Honey. He said, with a big grin on his, big silly grin on his face like this, he said, if you ever bring your guitar to school any more this year, I'm going to have to expel you for the rest of the year. Just like that. By then, he had worked uh, a bugle into his set. And uh, he had also gotten him a car with... Uh, that he had painted a map of the moon on top of the car. Uh, and he would stand on top of the car and play his guitar and his bugle. Decided I'd, I would take my car, my new car, that I had painted all over. I had the legendary Star, I had Stardust Cowboy painted in big, bold black letters. I just did it with a can of spray paint all the way down the sides. And my car was a dark green. My grandmother didn't like it. She said, I ruined my car. She took a, dro a, a broom to me. She's going to hit me with that broom. She, she never could catch me. She said, you ruined a perfectly good car. You need to take a rag and rub that paint off your car. But the paint had already set. I, she didn't want to see that car again. I took a paintbrush, a small paintbrush, and I painted in gold an orange, a checkerboard on the hood of my car. I sprayed the uh, tent on the windows of my car and it ran down and bubbled up. Driving around town, it looked like I was driving under the ocean. It had painted on, uh, on the door, it had Nassau presents the legendary Stardust Cowboy. Uh, and the windows were tinted, I don't know if it was like uh, to reduce the glare or just to give him kind of a uh, ethereal feeling while he was driving. It was kind of a real dark blue tint, as I remember, and you could barely see out of it at night. He had like certain spots around town that he would hit nightly uh, until he was run off, usually by uh, the owner of the place. He liked the Heidi Ho on 34th Street, the Heidi Ho on 50th, and the the Heidi Ho on uh, on Fourth Street. Those were his favorite places. Sometimes the the management would come out and run him off, uh, and you know sometimes people would run him off. And then he'd he'd show up at a party and uh, you know play. I mean, just you you just really would never know where he's going to show up next. Uh, I saw him play out at the Heidi Ho and. Uh, we, we, there was also a, fu a funny gig that we played one time that, that I think was even might have been the Flatlanders. I, I'm not certain about that. And, uh, but, uh, and Norman came in and 
was inside the place. And then later on in the afternoon, he was out on the parking lot. When, when we went outside, he was out there playing. And so we all gathered around and listened to him play. I remember driving by one time, and there was this guy out on his car, wailing away. And uh, it was my sister, actually, who was, was driving the car, she being older than I. And uh, she kind of gave me this look like, who? She knew who, I think he was in her class, or maybe a, a year or so ahead of her. And uh, the rumors had already spread, and probably some actual true tales had spread, but you didn't know what to believe. The cars would all be um, parked illegally. They would kind of come in and park, aiming towards you. It's like a like a drive-in, except instead of a uh, instead of a drive-in movie, here would be uh, Norman out there, uh, the center of of all these cars, kind of aiming towards you. Know. It was different, and for for Lubbock, which has ample parking in all directions, it was it was a kind of a cute little pattern to <laughs> see develop on the plains. When I was, had long hair down on my shoulders, mud chopped sideburns, a mustache, and dressed up like a cowboy, doing that hard rock stuff, old time, cow, old time country music fans thought I was making fun of them and country music. And there was a lot, I was told by the owners of clubs, the managers of clubs, a lot of times that I, they, they had to pull away from me. And some of these people from, uh, people from, uh, you know, trying to get close to me so I could beat me up. I even had to try to cut my hair off. Hair off the knife. Uh, I was doing that years. I was doing doing that many years before uh, Willie Nelson started growing long hair and started being a singing country music and, and Waylon Jennings too. I was doing that. I was way ahead of my time. For some reason, he was attracted to these hidey hoes and uh, and they were. You know, the most dangerous places in town because it was where all you know all the fights would take place on on the weekends all the uh, uh, hot riders all the jealous women and everything and so he'd be up there playing and i remember this one night uh a few people were gathered around and this one girl uh, was making fun of him and and he just kind of shined it on like uh you know, didn't really pay much attention to it. And I forget exactly what happened. He either laid his guitar down or uh, she came up to grab it off of him or something. But all I remember was turning around and seeing the front of his guitar just cave in, you know, with her foot going through it. And it was, uh, you know, it's a real sad day because that was his, it was his main squeeze, you know. And We had a little band called the T. Nickel House Band. And he used to come down there to our gigs, and sometimes he would like bring his trumpet or something and, and stand outside and play his trumpet. He sat in with us a couple of times down there. And that was the first time I really kind of got to know him. And then I lost track of him. And the next thing I knew, he was, he was on Laugh-In. Let me get this straight if I can, okay? Let me just stop you here and try and get caught up. You were on your way to New York, driving in your car. You wound up in Fort Worth. You were performing there, and some vacuum cleaner salesman saw your act, liked it enough, and took you someplace and got you to make a record? That's correct. What are the words? I mean, I, like, from the uh, like from the beginning. Verse, verse, verse one. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've got a gal right. way across town. town. She won't come to see me unless I pull my shades down. down. Yeah, glass shades, you know, sun shades on your glasses. Oh, oh, I thought you were talking about the window shades. I thought there was something going no, on there. No, no, no. <laughs> that's, oh, I like, think. that's my dirty mind. There you go. <laughs> dirty old man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're, we're, when we're, I go to the show. Oh, that's where we left off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Pull the shades, shades down. down. Paralyzed, paralyzed. Right. She put arms around her. She makes squeeze me. She makes me paralyzed. After a certain period of time I just lost lost track of him because I took off myself and went down uh, to Dallas and played down there and came back went down to Houston play and played and came back and during one of those trips Norman had just vanished you know at that time is when he went to Fort Worth I was manager of Phelps Queen vacuum cleaners in Fort Worth Texas and we had an office in the base but of KXL radio station 
and there was a uh, recording studio down there in which we got pretty familiar with a lot of the recording artists that would come in there and the people that run the recording studio and this particular evening when we come out of the uh, the office there the owner of uh, Filter Queen of Fort Worth owned a club called the Locker Room Club so when we were coming out of the office we noticed a green 1961 Chevrolet Park in the parking lot and it had legendary Stardust Cowboy written on the side of it and there was a gentleman sitting in the car so you know we wondered exactly what he was doing parked there in the parking lot so we walked over and started talking to him and at that time of course he introduced himself and told us what he was doing and he had a guitar with him and we told him that we was headed for a club and if he'd like to you know go along with us because he wanted to play us a couple songs there in the parking lot so we took him down to the locker room club with us and kind of got him familiar with everybody there. And he just kind of fit right into the crowd. And first thing we knew, he was up on the stage there just singing his own songs, in which we thought that was very unusual, but he had everybody's attention and everybody was kind of following in and, and joining the fun. And so there was so much response to him that we knew the the majority of all the people at KXOL and the people in the recording studio. So we thought, well, heck, we'll just go to the recording studio and maybe introduce him to some people and let them, you know, see if they'd be interested in doing anything with him. And that's pretty much where it, it led to. We started in about 65 or 66, so it was, a, it was a time of real experimentation. So we would stay up for five days in a row and go in and just distort sounds and turn tape around backwards and just trying to see what the studio was all about because when we bought it we didn't know anything we didn't you know we knew bass treble and volume which is about all it is anyway but across the hall were these guys who sold filter queen vacuum cleaners and they were very nice guys one morning after one of these five day binges studio binges one of the guys came in and said, man, you got to see this guy last night. He came into the Roundup Inn down here. The, no, what was it? The, the locker room, I think it was. Where all the hockey players hung out or something. It was like a triple-A hockey team in Fort Worth or something. And they hung out at the Dave Bloxham's locker room. They said, a guy came in. He, he said he was from Lubbock, Texas. And he... Uh, he wanted to sing for his supper. He wanted to know if he could do a show in the locker room for his uh, for his room that night. And the guy, the manager of the place, apparently said yes, he could. And they told me that he began to bring in instruments for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And uh, you know, they were. They, he said most of them were broken, and there was this amazing one-man band array of homemade instruments. Etc. and a bugle, and he, I mean, I, I think he named several instruments. And he said he set him up for a while, and then suddenly he got the microphone, and he starts screaming at the top of his lungs, and he, he said a waitress threw a whole <laughs> tray of drinks into the crowd, who probably didn't even notice. <laughs> and, uh, and then he sang for about 30 minutes, and he said everybody was on the floor laughing, and I said, you know, bring him in. And this, now, I'm sure this was maybe 8 o'clock in the morning, so maybe at 8.30 or 9, this very shy young guy came in, drove up in a green, kind of a lime green, military green Biscayne, and he had spray painted on the side, NASA presents the legendary Stardust Cowboy. And he, and he had tinted the windows himself. So they sort of ran like, it looked like the Adams Family kind of hearse or something. And then he, he had also made a surface map of the moon on the, on the uh, roof. And I, I never really looked inside. <laughs> I don't know what he had done in there. But he, he said he was on his way from Lubbock to New York to be on the Johnny Carson show. And I said, well, uh, do you, would you like to make a record? Would you like to record some singer stuff? I'd love to hear what, what you do. And he said, I think he said he would like to. <laughs> we said, go get him and bring him over here. 
and we'll all have some fun. We'll put him out there and start cutting him so we can see, because they told us that he was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. So, we did that. And it was so funny that some of us ran upstairs and got the people from the radio station. We got the disc jockeys and a couple of the girls and Jack Murray, who was the manager, said, you guys have got to hear this. Come down here. This is something you got to see and hear. Well, actually, they were kind of hearing it up there. Yeah, they, they, were hearing it, yeah. they couldn't figure out what all that racket was. We, we weren't really real serious about the whole thing. No, really. We took a real it was a fun, scrap tape. It was tape. a fun thing. It was cut on scrap Sorry. tape at seven and a half, so we didn't waste much. So the original master is at a seven and a half. That's IPS quite a is, is opposed to being a seriously uh, cut uh, uh, multi-track thing. Of course, multi-track wasn't that big then. Three track. Yeah, uh, three and four track. We had one of each, so we could mix down and, and do overdubs. But it was cut at seven and a half IPS on a mono machine. That's the way the thing was cut. So they, they, they came down, they went into the control room, and it was so funny. They were just cracking up, and, and the guy, Jack Murray, said, give me a piece of that tape. Give me two and a half, three minutes of that tape. So we just run off a bunch of it on a reel, cut it off, and gave it to him. And he went straight upstairs and played it on the air, which is not ever done in this world, you know? Not even back then. What's the second verse, though, when I go to the show? Yeah. When I go to the show, Boy, she sure does make a fellow be still. Paralyzed, paralyzed. When I look into her eyes, she makes me paralyzed. Hmm. She sure makes Sense. a fellow be, be still. Be That's stowed. a word I invented. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I <don't laughs> make the rhyme, right? Right. I just, make, I, just, I just make up the words. If I run out of words, I just make it up as I go along. And the band was just me on drums and, uh, and him on guitar. Or, or dobro. He had a dobro that the neck was broken on, so the strings were about that high off the neck so he could only play on the first fret we we just set up two microphones or what we had the drums set up almost all the time anyway and uh and we had a microphone in front of him and and we were we were just approaching it really it's just put put a bunch of things down on two track and see see what happens you know and uh i mean we were in a state of sleep deprivation that probably caused us to be more daring with this than we might have been otherwise but he gave me some instructions on the first song which was who's that knocking on my door you really got to rip on the brake okay with the same with the same tempo the same tempo as i sing it okay 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 yeah. <laughs> He wanted me to play drums, but in the same tempo that he was singing in. And I said I could do that, <laughs> maybe, probably. And then he said he was going to take a bugle solo, and then he wanted me to take a drum solo. And I found that all agreeable. And we did it. And it was, a, it was explosive. He was an explosive performer, to say the least. And then we did Paralyzed. And then we did maybe, I don't know, seven or eight other songs. I don't really know. It was a long time ago. But we did a lot of songs this first day. But I was so impressed by Paralyzed that, uh, that I took it upstairs to the radio station, which was a top 40 radio station called KXOL. I walked in with you know a seven-inch reel of quarter-inch tape of this little mono demo we had done of the legendary Stars Cowboy playing one chord and screaming in the bugle solos. And uh, I said, I, I want you to hear this. We just recorded this downstairs. I think it's really interesting. And he was just probably having his first cup of coffee or something in the morning. And uh, he listened to it. And at first, he didn't know. If, at first, I think he thought I was putting him on. And then he went through a wide range of emotions. I, I, I watched him go through like a whole sort of Strasbourg routine of, you know, <laughs> of, any, uh, of any sort of reaction he might possibly have, <laughs> trying to decide which one was the right one, you know. And at the end of it, he said, well, let me hear the other one, you know, because I told him it was two songs. I played him the other one. He, at the end of that one, he jumped up and he said, this is it. This is the new music, he decided. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right too. You know. It was new music, but <laughs> but uh, he decided that he was going to play it that night on the air, and he was going to promo it uh, every 15 minutes all day long. At eight o'clock that night, I believe it was, 
they were going to preview the new music by the legendary Stardust Cowboy. And uh, I remember we were all we were all very excited about it. We all waited anxiously in the studio all day until eight o'clock. And then I remember going out to the car with with Norman uh, and you know listening to the radio. And when it came on, it was thrilling. I, I, he he showed no reaction whatsoever. I, mean, I was I was uh, I was really nervous about it. Myself. <laughs> But uh, they got, they, they asked people then to call in and vote on whether they thought this was the new music or this was the worst thing they had ever heard. And we, we thought everybody was going to call in and say, this is the worst thing we've ever heard. And, but what happened was, I think, they had more, as I remember, they had more calls in a half hour than they had ever had in a whole day. I think they had like 300 calls in a half hour or an hour or something like that. And 250 of them said it was the greatest thing they'd ever heard. Now, this is something to highly recommend Fort Worth, by the way. Yeah. You know, that the people of Fort Worth can love this and embrace it so, so instantly. And the telephones lit up, and everybody called, and everybody started driving around, wondering what in the world's going on. And I think within the same, within a couple of hours, we, they came and got him, and we took him up there and interviewed him on the air. And then it got worse. Well, I wanted to write a song that would captivate everybody, and one that was wild. And uh, I took, uh, first I looked at Elvis Presley's music, and, and his music was too slow for me, so I wrote a song, you know, fit my style, mm -hmm. and fit what I was looking for, and it was even wilder than anything Elvis Presley ever came out with, you know, to promote myself. So I wrote Paralyzed, and it's been a smash hit. And mm -hmm. love looking at around. Number one request. Do you feel that um, that people understand what you're doing, or do do you feel that that you have a line of communication that they possibly are wondering about, or that they are really seriously understanding? Well, I uh, well, you, well, I guess you compare you can you can compare me with Einstein. Einstein was so smart that nobody could think on his level, and. Uh, a lot of people, I've explained different things to different people and said, said, man, you're just way above my head. And I don't know what you're talking about or anything like that. But there have been, been very, very, very few people I've ever run into that were smart enough to comprehend and actually understand what I'm talking about, think on my level. Most of them wanted to know the what, what is that, who is that, uh, is that, you gonna play that again? Would you play that again? You know, this, this was the reaction that most of them were saying. I'm sure they got some bad ones. And they got some calls that said, what, have you lost your mind? Because <laughs> we weren't too sure. At this point, we didn't know what was going on. And it no, all happened. They were asking us, what are you gonna do with it? I mean, what could you do with it, you know? Back in those days. <laughs> so, uh, are we even gonna talk about, <laughs> you know, the ex-military man? No, they know about him. They've, they've, they've already had a big problem with him. I think Major Bill got involved at this point because he, he caught wind of what was going on. Have you interviewed Major Bill? He won't. He won't, he won't be interviewed? Um, I, I Unless you're paying. He's never recorded, and he's never produced a record in his life. He's never produced a hit. He, he takes, he he takes records that other people workers. produce, puts his name on them, and he steals their, their thunder. Man, he never cut a record. From Delbert McClinton to Bruce Chanel to... Jay Frank who, Wilson who are and Paul and Paul. Stars, you know, and, and, and he goes around claiming <coughs> he did all this. He didn't do any of it. Somebody else did it. He made the deal. He was a he was a deal maker. He knew how to do that. That's all he ever had to do with the legendary Stardust Cowboy recordings, too. He made the deal. He made the deal. T Bone and I did all the recording. Frank. I was in the studio. But that was it. He never did a bit of it. I don't remember him even being there when no, we recorded. No, he never was. He, he never came was. and listened to it after it was all over. I mean, how hard was it to do? He didn't do anything. All he did was, all he did was, I mean, he did, He had a significant part of it, which is he sold it to Mercury it, within the week, because we, we pressed 500 records and on, on Cowboy's label, Psycho Suave Records, and, uh, and they sold, I think, really quickly. And I think those records today are very valuable, actually. Major Bill, among others, has been exploitative of a lot of artists. And one of the main reasons I wanted to work with Norman, Norman Odom, 
was because this guy had been unfairly taken advantage of. And he was extremely sincere about what he was doing, and he still is, I'm sure. Um, but some people think that they can make a fast buck off of somebody, and they don't treat them considerately, and they don't, they just, uh, they want to milk everything they can, and they're sharks, they're absolute sharks. And the music business is just rife with persons like that. Uh, we talked to Major Bill on the phone a couple of times before we headed down to Fort Worth for the interviews that we had to do down there, and he seemed like a nice enough fellow. He's, you know, pretty jolly on the phone and pretty cooperative and had some, some good things to say. And so we told him we were going to be down there and could we interview him, and he said, yeah, that would be fine. So on the, on the day that we arrived in Fort Worth, we gave him a call and to set up a time when we could talk to him, and he, it was almost as though we were talking to a different person. He, uh, was a little short with his answers. He uh, was kind of curious as to who else we were talking to and, and uh, what else we were going to be doing down there. And finally, he said, well, I don't know when a convenient time would be. You're going to have to call me back in a few hours. So I said, okay, fine, we'll, we'll do that. And finally, when I called him again, he just, he just flat out said that he would, not he would not grant us an interview unless we decided to uh, change the format of the film and make it about him as opposed to the legendary Stardust Cowboy, who, whom, he con he, whom he considered uh, more or less a, a minor footnote to his career, which, of course, if, if you talk to Major Bill at any length of time, um, over about 10 seconds, he uh, will, will shove in the fact that, that he uh, had something to do with a couple of records that, you know, that, that were pretty big hits in the, in the early 60s, but as it turns out, he really had not much to do with them at all, other than the fact that he would find these people, sign them up, and take their money. As far as I'm concerned, uh, them other people didn't have a damn thing to do with the legendary Stardust Cowboy. I put out, I put out a record called Psycho Suave uh, Record with a couple of things on it, with Paralyzed and Tootie Doo on it and stuff like that. I made the deal with 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 Mercury, which cost me eternally ever making another deal with them and stuff like that. And I'm the only guy I got him on laughing and, and stuff. As far as they are concerned, they didn't have a cotton-picking continental thing to do with the cowboy. And uh, that's the thing. I mean, you know, if he is anything, I made him what he is. So uh, that's the point, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, number one, I don't think people would give piddly squat dude to hear about somebody talk about the, the legendary Stardust Cowboy. I think you're you're peeing up a rope myself. I don't know if this is a true story or not, but the, so the way I understand it is that he was a sergeant in the Air Force, and that, uh, that one day while he was in the Air Force, his commanding officer, who was a major, was uh, killed or died, and so Major no, Sergeant Smith became a major for one day because he, he filled that, that position, or however you would say it in that sort of language. And, uh, and when he retired after 20 years in the Air Force, he was retired as a sergeant, but he was reading the manual one day and he found out that when you're in the military, you're retired at the highest rank you held when, they, when you're in the military. So he went back and got retired in a major's pay with a major's uh, title, I suppose. And, uh, and I guess had surplus money and became a record producer. Uh, and he was trying, he, I think he fancied himself a Colonel Tom type character. And he produced Last Kiss. He, he produced one great record, which was Hey Baby by Bruce Chanel with Delbert McClinton playing harmonica on it. And he produced also, If You Really Want Me To, I'll Go, I Think. Or, you know, produced, I don't know what, I don't know what he did. I never know what hey, he Paul. did. What? Hey, Paul, hey, Paula. Hey, Paula, he, he did in Last Kiss by J. Frank Wilson, is it? Was it? At any rate, he had some success out of that town when no one else did. And he was the only one who had any connections. And uh, I think when this thing happened with the cowboy, uh, he just came in and said, look, let me sell it for you. I can get you this amount of money or whatever. I don't remember. I, I, did, has anyone said what he sold it for? I don't I never saw a dime. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what he did. 
but he was he was uh, I don't think he was a you know criminal or anything but I don't think he really had a, a clue as to what was going on he used to say cut and pick and smash all the time so anytime you uh, everything was a cut and pick and smash uh, I first became aware of the ledge in uh, gosh it was probably 1968 69 I was working for Mercury Records in Chicago uh, I was running their publicity department uh, and I guess what happened I guess the circumstances were that his record must have uh, started getting some local activity out of Texas maybe Lubbock somewhere in Texas and the record was brought to the attention of Mercury Records by Major Bill Smith and Mercury picked it up for uh, for national distribution uh, and that's when myself and uh, fellow who I worked for named John Sipple, uh, who ran the publicity department at Mercury. Um, John, uh, John and I both worked on <coughs> the ledge in terms of getting television appearances and uh, getting press, getting people to write about them. I, I couldn't believe the record. I'd never heard a record like this before. And I mean, I'm, I'm a big pop music, big rock fan. Um, I didn't quite get it, you know. But there was still no escaping the fact that this record was happening locally out of Texas, so there was something going on for it. And when our promotion department got involved, uh, they must have gotten some airplay on it because it did, uh, it did make some moves on the Billboard charts. I mean, I don't know how high it got, uh, but it was definitely at least a mid-chart record, which would have meant that, that it got airplay and sold. I think, you know, certainly uh, a lot of that had to do with the novelty aspects sure. of the record, you know, and the attendant press and things that we created, uh, you know, around it. I mean, I read the two, probably the two things I remember most at that time about him uh, and about that record were, number one, there was a story that he got his start uh, playing on the top of automobiles at the Dairy Queen in Lubbock. That was one story that, that struck me, being, you know, somewhat unique. And secondly, um, and I was hoping to see him when I looked at the, uh, the, the uh, kinescope or whatever, laughing, but that there was a one-armed, that his drummer was a one-armed Indian uh, on the record. Now, the guy playing on laughing had two arms, uh, and I know that T-Bone Burnett, I believe, uh, played drums for a while yeah. with him. Uh, so the whole thing about this one-armed drummer, I, I don't know if that's just a myth or, uh, I mean, if it actually was. I mean, you listen to Paralyzed, and it, uh, on the surface, on face value, it makes sense that it was a one-armed drummer. I mean, it sounds like it. The whole thing probably, I think, happened in a month. It went on the charts for two weeks on the charts. He played the, you know, laugh in, which was which was diabolical. It was, that, was the mo that was the low point of the whole thing. I mean, it was a big coup for that time. You know, I mean, that was, you know, it was akin at that time, 20 years ago or whatever, to getting, you know, someone on, uh, you know, Arsenio Hall, or, or even tougher because it was a weekly show, and uh, I, I don't recall Lappin having a lot of musical guests at that time. I missed like one of those words. Uh, could you recite the uh, whole thing? Okay. I, I, I threw my baby in a sack, threw her over my back, and took off in a big black Cadillac. Paralyzed, paralyzed. She puts her arms around me. She keeps me warm from the storm. She makes me paralyzed. Leverace taped his show before I taped mine, and he stuck around to see me tape mine. And uh, Peter Lawford was there, and Lawrence Harvey was there, and they saw me tape my show. There was a high school that was on tour of the NBC studios. They sat up in the bleachers and watched me tape it. I threw a bugle up in the air as part of my act, and everybody ducked. I just barely missed these big overhead lights, almost bingo. I almost knocked one out. Uh, I sat over there and talked with Liberace when he was out there uh, before we actually <coughs> did, the, did the taping, and, uh, and he was out there. They were getting him set where he was going to stand a lot of good that did. But Liberace said that this guy's worth a million dollars. 
Yeah, I hope so. Everybody knew it was it was going to happen. I don't remember who got the word out, but everybody knew that he was going to be on there. Uh, and so all the, uh, you know, all the people who knew him in Lubbock were gathered around the TV set. I remember being real mad about it uh, because, you know, they, they kind of put him up there and then Rowan and Martin were kind of walking around him making wisecracks and and then people, then the whole cast started coming on. And it, it made me mad, you know, and, and I could see that he was getting mad, too. You know, I could, I could tell that he just didn't like that. He wanted to just sit up there and do his thing, and he was doing it great. Look, that whole thing, I'm sure it was Mercury through William Mars or whoever at the time, uh, that took it serious. It, it wasn't all just a big joke. Back in December, December 16th, musicians went on strike. American Federation of Musicians Union Nationwide. Well, they went on strike, and I was a member of the union. So I played the guitar and had to be a member of the union you know, on national TV. They, they went on strike, and uh, I was supposed to schedule a contract with for me to be on Les Sullivan back in, uh, back in uh, December 68. I was supposed to be paid two thousand dollars every year, every two year, every time for the next two years. I was to be paid the same amount, no matter where I performed. That's how he made. That's why he, how he broke in new talent for the big time. So the musician strike was over the following May. By that time, Paralyzed had, had slid down the charts, and uh, that was it. Couldn't be on that Sullivan. And they had the bookings for uh, Dick Clark, uh, Joey Bishop, uh, Ed Sullivan was being negotiated at the time. It was almost a cinch thing. I mean, we just saw that go to heck real quick. And uh, that strike lasted for four months, I guess, something like that. It's obvious that it, had it been able to spread instead of being stymied like it was, you know, if, if you sell 5,000 records in one day, and, in Cleveland, Ohio, you know, you've, you've sold as many records probably as a Garth Brooks would today, if not more. And I don't, I don't know. I guess he kind of had a following, you know, cult, whatever, by the time it was all over, but they were so scattered, you know, it wasn't any way. And Mercury kept releasing records, but I don't think any of them ever had impact like Paralyzed. I took a trip in a Jiminy spacecraft. And I thought about you I passed through the shadow of Jupiter And I thought about you I shot my space gun Well, I really... And I'm sure there was some mismanagement. It was happening too fast, even for us. And, uh... Of course, after it all died down, then everybody kind of lost interest. And that's really where Chip came into it, because he was trying to keep him going for himself, I'm sure. He, get, he got a manager. I think David arranged for him to get uh, Whitmore, Chip Whitmore, as his manager. But this was after... And I'd had a lot of, I had had a lot of problems with, with Whitmore. And there was contracts starting to fly every direction, and it was starting to really get muddy, and I just backed out. I just said, I'm not going to get involved in all this, because it, it was heading for trouble, you know. This was after, though, everything had happened with Mercury. There weren't any more records. Uh, he was wanting to do some work, and Chip had some deals set in uh, some of the joints around town where he could get him in there, and, and he could make some money. And this was after the television stuff was gone, I mean, the impact of it all. I want to tell you how strong Chip was. This okay. is no joke. He practiced law. I mean, he was practicing law, winning cases, and everything else. He wasn't even a lawyer. <laughs> Getting divorces from people. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't even a lawyer. Monday, May 5th, 69. My former manager, James Edgar Whitmore, Jr., had me to move into his apartment that he moved out because I didn't have a place to stay. So I, so I sneaked in out the back window, you know, for several days, had a suitcase, sunbeam electric razor, Bag of marshmallows, fruit pies. But one day I came back in, came back in from work, and everything was gone. So I called the cops and I've been robbed. Because actually the owner came and took my stuff. I was sitting in there in the living room. Here came the police, Fort Worth police, with the owner of the apartments. So you're not supposed to be in here. You're on 
trespassing on property. So they, so they uh, conveniently handcuffed me and took me on down to a city jail. A couple hours later, I thought I was getting out. But here came some journalists. One was with the AP, one was with Four Star <coughs> Telegram, Fort Worth Press, and Dallas Times Herald, four other, four other newspapers. They interviewed me, but they didn't want me to mention Major, Major Bill Smith's name for fear of a lawsuit. He's powerful man. Come, yeah, come. This went out on the eighth Associated Press, you know, by me being busted as a vagrant in my former manager's apartment, former manager's former apartment, therefore worth. Another story to that effect is Major Bill Smith took a tape of about 50 some odd songs that I'd recorded T Bowman at studio one day. He took the master tape, stole them from him, had them in his office. So I wanted them back. Did Chip put him up to that? Chip wanted to get a hold of everything. <laughs> I know. So he sent the cowboy down there one night to break in there and get the files and everything. He took every everything out of there. And he walked it. Of course, he didn't have a car. I went down to a studio and had, had the master tape run off onto a seven inch reel. And at the house, I played the songs through, wrote them down on paper, and, and unraveled the uh, reel of tape down the middle of Henderson Street in Fort Worth. So Major Bill Smith and nobody else could get their hands on my music. And I had written an outline, uh, <coughs> an outline of a musical motion picture called The Stardust in Your Eyes, which is about the legendary Stardust Cowboy. And I ha had written 18 songs that goes with the musical. And I had people trying to steal the songs from that, steal that idea from me. It's about the legendary Stardust Cowboy, who he is, what he does, throughout the entire uh, two-hour musical. When I knew him, like in high school and stuff, he used to come into the donut shop, and he had these huge books, like like operas or something that he had written. Just He had three or four of them, you know, and, it, and we'd go through them, and he'd show me all of his songs, and there were hundreds of them in there. And and then after the, the Fort Worth and the Laughing stuff, uh, he was telling me about all these books and about his tapes and everything, and he, he said he had burned all of the books to keep them, to keep Major Bill from getting them. And I said, I remember saying, you burned all of, all of those songs? He said, oh yeah. He said, uh, he can't get them now, but I still know them. I still remember them. Do you remember the stories that he wrote when he first came here? He had a book. I, I, I was the only one. I was the only one interested in the book. I I sat yeah. down and read it thoroughly. I read everything he wrote. I had an appointment with somebody in Dallas one day, and I sat in the office. I was supposed to be there forward at six thirty. I was still sitting there reading that book. It was kind of an ongoing character uh, that I remember. A lot of these uh, things that he showed me at the donut shop were different stories that had uh, the legendary Stardust Cowboy like. Uh, going to Mars and uh, and going to you know Jupiter and Saturn and and coming back and uh, telling people on Earth what he found and so that was it was kind of an ongoing character that uh, that he started making you know making songs up about it that guy's adventures which became his own adventures. In '67, I wrote the outline of a, of a two-hour musical motion picture called. There are stardust in your eyes, based upon the same theme. Uh, the theme of the song, There are stardust in your eyes. Eighteen songs. Uh, I wrote all the narration, the dialogue for it. It's about the it's, it's about who the legendary stardust cowboy is and what he does. He rides Pegasus throughout the universe, flies Pegasus throughout the universe. Gaylord, a talking four-leaf clover, Pierce and Ansel Pell. He tells, he tells uh, about uh, these Martians on Mars lost their soldering irons. They had no soldering irons to put their finished bill in their spacecraft, their flying saucer. So he commands a, a Pegasus to fly to Mars. They get to Mars and hover about three feet over the ground. And he, they ask him, well, what do you want? Uh, we, 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 we lost our soldering guns. And they start singing a song, a song about their soldering guns. So the legendary Stardust Cowboy pulls out his six-shooter and shoots it 
Stardust comes out, and all of a sudden, soldering guns appear in their hands, so they can continue building their spacecraft. He commands Pegasus to touch the ground with his hoofs. Fugalite bursts forth from his hoofs in the form of lightning, and the Martians have amnesia. They don't remember the last five minutes. Then they fly away through the Milky Way again for another mission. There was a contest going on, a travel contest of some kind. You know, you put things together, and if it matched up, you win a trip, win uh, maybe a set of glasses or something like this or anyway. And there were cash prizes as well. So Cowboy had some kind of deal. Maybe it was four pieces you had to match up on a card and everything. Cowboy walked all over town, station to station. You didn't have to make a purchase. He walked all over Fort Worth. But he finally put it together, and he won $1,000 cash. He got the $1,000 cash. He went downtown, he bought him a car for $800, I believe, and then he kept a couple hundred. So anyway, he drives back down, and he goes, he's really excited about everything. He goes over to Chip Whitmore's apartment to let him know, you know, he had won and that he had bought the car. Chip said, okay. He said, Ledge, this isn't good for your image to have this car. I mean, the, the image of the thing is, is that that you're struggling out there and also he said we're going to take the car back he said how much money you got left lady said two or three hundred dollars he said okay give that to me did that he took the car back down there and sold it back to the guy for six hundred bucks he gave legendary i believe he gave ledge a hundred dollars and told him that his next project was to hitchhike to las vegas years of diminishing returns in fort worth convinced norman that a change of scenery was in order it was a change that resulted in his first full-length LP, Rocket to Stardom. I had been on for about uh, two or three weeks at that point uh, during the radio show, and I was going to do a live show at the uh, State Fair of Texas uh, at the Modern Living Building. So the first time I actually met the legendary Stardust Cowboy was uh, a rendezvous at the radio station there in Dallas. And then we went directly over to the State Fair of Texas, and we did this program. Um, and it was a live show originating from a booth in the State Fair. We had speakers set up where we, my program generally was rhythm and blues and rockabilly but I played some of his records, and for the rest of the material that was going on, people would just walk by and kind of look over at you and kind of wonder why these people, you know, this person in this booth is irritating them. And then we'd put on the legendary Stardust Cowboys recordings, the stuff that was on Mercury and Psycho Suave, and um, I'd cue up a record and started playing and then maybe talk with him just a moment and look up and all of a sudden there were people lined up about six deep and you know like hog farmers with bib overalls that were there to see their wives cooking you know at the at the baking pavilion or whatever and then you know like some hippies walking by the zip in and bankers and all sorts of different people that just show up and everybody was standing around with these like you know watermelon grins from ear to ear and I thought boy this is really odd you know that you get such a diverse crowd that really is going for this guy's recordings the program that followed us was uh, the Panthers and the people and it was hosted by the head of the Dallas Black Panthers chapter and he called in he didn't want to come down to the State Fair and do his program live from the State Fair but he called and he said, keep on going, brother. We're really digging your show out there. And even the Black Panthers were digging the legendary Stardust Cowboy. So, you know, at that point I was thinking, now, you know, there's something really unusual about this right here when it's getting such a diverse audience that universally was really, you know, just giddy about his music. Nobody else made him. He is what he is, and he had been for quite a long time before any of these other persons came onto the scene. And there were a few people that were appreciative of what he was doing, and there were many, many more people that were exploitative of what he was doing.
And so I felt like this guy needs a fair shake. At the point uh, that that was released, I had a fairly new company, Amazing Records. And I put this out on a subsidiary series, the Luna series. It was um, definitely on the fringe, but this is a market that will accommodate the fringe, which actually is the fringe. I mean, this whole independent record business is the fringe. So I didn't have any problems. I didn't sell a whole lot either, for that matter, but I didn't manufacture that many. We pretty well sold everything that we manufactured, but it was only, you know, 1,500, 2,000 copies. There were 100 copies that were put out on uh, Passionate Pink vinyl, which is uh, the legendary Stardust Cowboys' favorite color. Um, in reality, that was part in pink. I found a box of uh, vinyl in Nashville that was labeled uh, part in pink, and Dolly Parton supposedly had gotten an EP made, and she had her manager get the vinyl to match a tube of lipstick. And, and so that was the part in pink, but we called it passionate pink because that's uh, Ledge's favorite color. And uh, let's see, we had clear vinyl, which uh, when played on a turntable, it looked like it was running backwards. And then we had um, blue, and uh, that was in honor of the blue for America, blue and the flag. <laughs> And then there was the ever-popular uh, gold vinyl, which uh, there were a limited number of those put out, more than the passionate pink, but still it was limited. And that's because the uh, legendary Stardust Cowboy had always longed to have a gold record. So I put out a gold record for him. I put drums on his recording session he did for Amazing Records. We did that in Grand Prairie, Texas, like in 1979 and 80, I believe, or maybe it was a little later. It must have been like 81 or so, 82. It was great. He was, uh, he would just start a song. He would just, wouldn't tell us what key or anything. He would just start singing and we'd start playing. <laughs> it was real spontaneous. It was a lot of fun. And amazingly enough, some of it turned out all right, considering the chaotic conditions we recorded it under. There was a few cuts that were, he, he, he did like a, a acoustic guitar and a vocal, and we went in and overdubbed a backing track. But most of the stuff was spontaneous, where we just, he would sing and we would play all at the same time. Oh, there's a lot of cactus everywhere. As I heard my cattle through the desert, over here there's barrel cactus, over there sorrel cactus. Yeah. I've been a fan of the ledge for, for many years, and I had no idea that he even lived here in Las Vegas. And I thought he lived in Lubbock, Texas. I have a lot of family back in Texas as well. I have family in Lubbock, and I've been back there actually looking for him back there, and nobody knew where he was. And uh, I came back out here and, and found out he was... Uh, living right here in Vegas, and I really couldn't believe it. Matter of fact, the guy came to the store and said, hey, you know, Ledge, I work with the Ledge. And I said, you're kidding. And he says, yeah, I work with him every day. So uh, I said, well, get a hold of him and tell him to give me a call. And, and uh, I gave him my number and didn't hear back from him or anything, so I pursued it and called the Dunes Hotel where he worked and left a message there for him and gave me a call. And, uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning, I get this phone call and uh, answer the phone. And this guy says, Hello, I'm Norman Odom. And I said, Oh my God, you know, I didn't expect to hear from you. Uh, so, uh, I heard you were living here in town. We talked on the phone for about two hours in the middle of the night. And the next day, he comes packing into the store with a great big old suitcase just full of paraphernalia for the last 20 years. Showing me where he'd been and all the shows he'd played and everything about him. Came in on this really nice bright orange outfit with gold stars sewed all over. Uh, that was my first meeting with him. I think that was in 1983. I think in 1983, about the time of the of the, of the Rocket Stardom album. And uh, 
we we hit it off real big. He's been hanging out here for years. And until we moved, he's up in San Francisco now. But he used to hang out here and tell me stories every day. We'd sit here and and uh, read the USA Today and drink 7-Eleven coffee every morning. He had a gun. And he lived right downtown. You know, just a couple of blocks from all the casinos right downtown. It was an apartment complex. And there was, there was a vacant lot just right across the street. So he took his gun out and took some cans across the street and started doing some target practice out there. And all of a sudden, there were cops everywhere. And he got arrested and, and lost his permit for his gun, too. It was pretty hard, pretty hard on a cowboy. No, I didn't have a place to go to to shoot my gun. So I took my gun out there, out there in a big vacant lot next door to where I was living. Had, had a tree stump out there about yay big. Had an empty Diet Pepsi can on the tree stump. I pulled out my, my Bud Line Special, nine inch barrel. I looked at the rim fire magnums, the long ones. Really pack a wallop. Big kick. I started firing that, I was 30 feet away. Started firing at the, at the uh, at the empty, empty Pepsi can. All that noise drove, drove the landlord out the side. She got, she was out there with her cane. Cane, you know, she's in her 70s, out there with the cane. She was watching, she was watching, look at the can, looking back at me. Like, like she's watching the tennis game. <laughs> and all the tennis, 15 tennis came out of the rooms. Rooms like termites, you know. They were doing the same thing. Back and forth. And they, they saw, they, their hands went back and forth so much I had to use a sorbet junior later on in the next. <laughs> well, anyway, I missed the can. And all my bullets went bouncing in the parking lot across the alley and at the blood bank. <laughs> here came the police. Four cops' cars, four different directions, jumping out of their cars with their guns drawn, pointed straight at me and said, Hey, bud, drop your gun and lie down on your stomach, spread out slowly. <laughs> One cop said, I was stupid! I got a Sierra two-year-old daughter! Got more brains than you! You don't have any brains, you're stupid! There was a guy, a hobo, sleeping in his car right next to me, and I didn't know anybody was in a car. Woke him up. He stuck his head out of the car window, wasn't know what was going on. I was surprised the bullet didn't ricochet and hit him. Police, police dragged him out of his car, searched him, did a body search, for weapons, took his driver's license, ran a check on him nationwide to the FBI, CIA, Secret Service, everybody, see if he was wanted. He came up clear, and I told him to get his car out of there, and so too, it's against the law to sleep in his car in the city limits of Las Vegas. And they said, you, buddy, and they ran a check on me. I wasn't wanted anywhere, but they said, you're going to jail. And they conveniently handcuffed me <laughs> and took me on down to the Las Vegas city jail. Well, <clears throat> I was uh, making phone calls trying to, I, I, I called my boss at the Dunes Hotel, said I won't be at work tonight, I'm in jail, I got locked up. So he, he could only uh, shoot planks after that. He used to come down here and shoot off his gun down here quite a bit, blow his trumpet and stand out here and sing Christmas carols and shoot his gun out in the street. And uh, I don't know, it was a lot of fun, but it was kind of scary at times, too. You know, a lot of people would be ducking and running and stuff, and I kept telling you, know, you better be careful when you do that, because somebody might think that thing's really loaded. Finally, somebody broke in his house and stole all his stuff and stole his gun. And so he, as far as I know, I don't think he has a gun anymore. He does. He does? Yeah, he does. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's good to hear, really. But anyway, I got him up to uh, New York the first time he ever made it up there. And it was, he was the media darling up there uh, for the show that he did at uh, Folk City, at Gertie's Folk City, which was the place where Dylan was more or less discovered. So uh, maybe they thought they had another Bob Dylan on their hands. I don't know. But anyway, it was, it was a great show. I backed up the legendary Stardust Cowboy on uh, guitar and trombone at Folk City. Uh, it was his New York debut. Todd Abramson, who booked um, Folk City, which is a club which is no, no longer exists, he brought the ledge up um, through 
the Legends manager, Jimmy Anaway, and we put a band together in New York to be the legendary Stardust Cowboys band. And uh, it was really great because uh, he showed up the night before for, re for a rehearsal and was complaining that someone had stolen his guns. And so we, were, we rehearsed Ghost Riders in the Sky, which is where he makes his entrance, and he's supposed to be shooting off his guns, and uh, he just didn't know what to do without his guns. You know? <laughs> he was like completely lost. He couldn't, he couldn't even walk up to the microphone with us playing the theme song without his guns, because it just wasn't right. It completely threw him off not to have them. And uh, we did the rehearsal, and the rehearsal was amazing. It was really, really great. And uh, he complimented my harmonica playing, which was probably, you know, one of the most important compliments of my life. So he insisted on this long sound check with just the bugle, you know, before we even, I don't even know if we even ended up playing the songs, like a bugle check, you know. <laughs> and uh, then uh, the band goes out to E after sound check, and Norman says to me, they left. How are we going to play? I said, they went out to E. He goes, no, I think they left. I said, no, they just went to E. They'll be back. And he wouldn't believe me. But, you know, so we had to go looking for them. And uh, we found them. And they, they promised that they would indeed return in time for this show. <laughs> While we were watching the Grammys, Norman turned to me and he says, you know who my audience is, don't you? And I said, no. He says, soul people. We went into Holland, and it has a pretty liberal media, too. And uh, he was uh, sort of the toast of the town there. Uh, locals were really shocked at the media event that he created the first time that we went there. And they were saying, well, you know, people like, oh, Tina Turner, or I don't know who else, Julian Lennon was just having some recordings coming out. Nobody received anywhere near the response that the legendary Stardust Cowboy did. And uh, in two weeks' time, he did something like 55 interviews um, while we were there. And uh, it was just one person after another. Some of the major uh, media people were literally lined up outside this little cabin that we had in Nijmegen, Holland, which is right on the German border, and uh, out in the woods. And, uh, of course, the legendary Stardust Cowboy took it completely in stride. It was all to be expected. But uh, the locals were just shaking their heads going, we've never seen anything like this. It's like the second coming of the Beatles or something. But anyway, we did the shows, and uh, it was really well received, and it was good rock and roll. The band really was perfect with the legendary Stardust Cowboy. And it gave him that kind of uh, foundation that he needed to really be able to take off, to have the confidence that he had a good band in back of him and he could just rock. We went uh, over to Australia, and when we were met in Melbourne, there were about 15 people that showed up and met us, and it was a real nice reception. We went on, did shows down there, did the Hey Hey It's Saturday program, which was kind of a combination of Laugh-In and, um, and Saturday Night Live, combination of the whole thing. And um, next day, we were walking around downtown Melbourne, and people were pointing at him you know, and thinking he was some sort of celebrity, and then all of a sudden a police car pulled up, and these cops jumped out, came up to him, he said, are you going to arrest me? And they said, oh, no, 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 we just want your autograph. So they pulled out this suspect book that they had and said, we saw you on Hey, Hey, It's Saturday. Would you autograph our suspect book? So he pulled out his, his gold ink pen it had gold ink, and he proceeded to sign their suspect book, and they were real happy, and he was happy, and he was a celebrity down there. I asked him on the plane coming from Sydney to Melbourne, I said, well now, 
you have achieved what you really aspired to. Now that you've done this, if you can't continue performing around the world and doing all this, what would you like to try to do as a future goal? And so he kind of thought a minute, sat back there, and was real quiet for about a minute. And then he said, well, if I can't continue performing, doing shows, and making records, and appearing on television, then if I can't do that, I think what I'd like to do is make movies. <laughs> and at that point, I just said, oh, hey, uh, man, you're on your own from here on. I think this is it. <laughs> I don't think I can help you any farther. <laughs> At about this same point, he decided that I really had not done a sufficient job in promoting him because I had not gotten him on to The Tonight Show, which was still his objective. And even though he'd been on the most popular show in Australia, live, and had been very well received. He still had not been on The Tonight Show. And he told me that not only did he want to be on The Tonight Show, and I was thinking in terms of him being a guest, but he wanted to be the guest host. And at that point, I just really thought, oh, I don't think I can help you any farther at this point. I first met The Ledge in July of 1985. I uh, went down to Hollywood to play a gig. And uh, just before I went down there, I found out that The Ledge would be headlining that gig. And, uh, and I just you know, almost had a heart attack because I had been turned on to Paralyzed a couple of years before. So uh, we went down to the club lingerie in Hollywood and um, and met the guy and played with him and it was truly one of the most awe-inspiring things that ever happened to me and I, it was one of those moments where I felt like uh, what it, I started thinking this must have been what it was like to see Elvis or Little Richard or Jerry Lee in their prime and that night uh, Elvis Costello and T-Bone Burnett showed up together and T-Bone Burnett played drums on Paralyzed and Dave Alvin from the Blasters and X uh, was there. And it was great. There was quite a star-studded night. I think Dr. Domeno might have dropped by. But uh, it was really incredible. So immediately the seed of thought, the, the thought was put in our heads to try to bring the ledge up to San Francisco. And uh, so we got in touch with him over in Las Vegas, actually with his best friend at the time, Wayne Coiner and uh, said, okay, how do we get the ledge to the, up to the city? I said, okay, well, here's the details. And uh, the ledge came up on Valentine's Day of 1986. And uh, not long before the gig, uh, his, you know, we were under the impression that his band would come with him, but the band couldn't make it, so they asked my band at the time to back him up. So all of a sudden, not only were we having the honor of putting on the very first Stardust Cowboy show in San Francisco, but also we would be his backup band. So he comes into town and um, he, he brings with him the biggest rainstorm we'd ever had in, uh, in the area, like in 20 years. And uh, it was like some biblical prophecy or something, you know, the flooding everywhere and it was just crazy. And I thought, oh my God, this has got to have something to do with the ledge. Sure enough, every single time he came to the Bay Area after that, for the next few years, it rained, no matter what time of the year it was. Middle of the summer, the ledge would come to do a gig, it would rain, you know, which was very odd. 
I think we brought the ledge back in August of 86 to make records with us. We wanted to make, we had this, we didn't have much money or any, we didn't have any distribution or anything like that. We just said, you know, God, we'll scrape together this money and we'll, uh, the bass player, uh, or our friend Gary Stillins, who later became the bass player, said, God, the ledge is so great. We've got to, you know, get him, uh, get a record out by him. So he came back that summer and we recorded, uh, Standing in a trash can, thinking of you, and the flip was uh, my underwear froze to the clothesline. And both songs were recorded on the first take, completely live in the studio, no overdubs, and they were just, we knew right after we did them that they were instant classics. My underwear froze to the clothesline. Look, you're living in Vegas. There's no music scene in Vegas, and at least the Bay Area, there's you know halfway decent amount of clubs, and and there's a lot of college radio, and a lot of people writing about music and going to clubs, and and you know I, I can't I, I can't assure you that by moving here you're going to make it big, you know, but you at least you get out of Vegas and be around more of you know, a better musical environment. And uh, so I convinced the ledge to move up here. We put out these records. Uh, then, then we did another album, I guess, uh, 88. And uh, that came out over in 88 or 89. It came out over in France. And we spent about six months or a year trying to get American labels to put it out. I think we sent it to everybody, big and small. And uh, there wasn't anybody interested in putting it out. It was really, it was really pitiful because we knew the record was really great, but um, the ledge being as unique as he is, there's no way that these labels were gonna, you know, try to put out something by a guy who wears orange uh, jumpsuits with 16-inch uh, wide bell bottoms and does strip teases on stage. His first name is, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the ubiquitous, legendary Stardust Cowboy. Yeehaw! Mr. Stardust's eccentric style earned him a lot of attention in the late 60s, most notably from David Bowie, who was so enamored with the ledge, he borrowed his name for the Ziggy Stardust project. And when he's not on stage, you'll find the ledge pursuing his favorite hobby, space shuttles. So I figured what better place to do the interview than Toronto's own Tour of the Universe. Is this going to be your first time in the space? Oh, yes, first time. Since I was born, before I was born, I came from outer space. You going to take a picture of that one there? Now, how did you get the name Legendary? Well, I just I put, the, I put the moon and the stars together with westerns, cowboys, came up with Stardust Cowboys and later on. Uh, after many years of entertaining, I just added on legend, Legendary because uh, I'm a living legend of my own time. We always hear when we're touring around and how people always want to tell you how they first heard the ledge. And uh, one guy that we met in LA a few years back said that he, uh, he had just moved to some town and he walked into this bar and all these regulars threw quarters at him. And he was like, bewildered. B-22, play yeah. B-22. And they go and he picks up one of the quarters and goes to the jukebox and puts it in because they said, you know, play. B-22, and he plays it, and is paralyzed. 
This is the way these regulars initiated new patrons to the bar. Somebody else was shopping in like the late 60s or early 70s and bought a box of laundry detergent. And for some reason, oh, yeah. there was a copy of Paralyzed taped to the box of the detergent. And nobody knows how or why it got there. A friend of mine named Bill Delacruz, he was either managing somebody's campaign or running for a student body office at Southport High School in Indianapolis. And uh, uh, they used to have their campaign commercials on the public address systems in the morning uh, at the time when they were giving all the rest of the school's announcements for that day. And uh, he used to start his campaign uh, a speech, I forget if it was student body president or student council president, probably student body president. And he used to play Paralyzed. Now this was at about 8.30 in the morning. And uh, he got away with that one or two days, and then they, they finally shut him off. They, they, they wouldn't allow him to do this anymore because it was too upsetting to everybody. He played me this single, and I was just, I, he said, have you ever heard of this? And I said, no, Legendary Stardust Cowboy. I was thinking it was going to be like, you know, Western songs or something, you know. And then I heard it, and I just could not believe what I heard. It was, to me, it was like hearing Ornette Coleman's first record or something. It was just uh, it, it, decomposing. Yeah, before my very years. But it really changed my life, having heard that record. I remember being profoundly affected by it. Um, I had been a, an old fan of The Who. I liked the idea of, the, of them destroying their equipment. And uh, though uh, actually the ledge didn't really destroy anything, he, uh, he seemed to be uh, on the ledge. And he was uh, very, um, I thought it was very spiritual. And I, I believe that, uh, he, uh, he came along at a time when there was a lot of overt political oppression in this country. Now, I'm not saying that he was making a political statement, but I believe that uh, he was a, a good reaction. And I, I also believe that he sort of accessed, he, he tapped into a lot, of, uh, a lot of the rage and anger that people were feeling, but because of societal pressures were afraid to express. And I think that... Uh, uh, he, he was very important. Uh, he was very important to me. And uh, um, over the years, uh, the people that I've told about his music or played the single for, they uh, uh, generally, the more a person knew about music, the better they liked his record. Now, some people, when you play them the record, you, they thought maybe that you were trying to goof on them or, or make fun of them or something because yeah, if you li listen to this record uh, uh, and you don't know a lot about music, you might think that it's just a joke, but I think that in terms of the spontaneity of the recording, it's completely lo-fi. I mean, the drums are, the drums are so recorded in such a way that they, they're actually, the signal is breaking up. And he, he crosses a lot of lines in terms of what would be thought of as quality. And uh, to me, uh, I believe that, uh, as uh, a painter named Hans Hoffman once said, is that uh, quality is synonymous with the spirit in which something is made. And I like the spirit that this, that this record was made in. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I didn't quite get that. I ran through the refrigerator, hungry as an alligator. I opened the door, and what did I see? I saw my baby staring right back at me. Paralyzed, paralyzed. Oh my God. She jumped I... into my arms. She gave me all of her charms. She makes me paralyzed. When he came back to Lubbock, he had these brand new shaps. And uh, I remember him coming over to, to my house, at uh, my mother's house. And he had his brand new shaps that it, he had made, and he had this whole box full of stars that were made out of solid lead. They were about this big, about that thick. And uh, I asked him what he was going to do with those stars, and he said, well, uh, he said, my fans are starting to get rowdy now, and, and they want a piece of me, and so I'm going to throw these lead stars out for souvenirs. <laughs> met him at the airport to pick him up at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. 
Um, he got off the plane and he was carrying a manila envelope in hand. And um, I just said to him, well, let's go get your bags. And he said, well, I don't have any. I said, what? You don't have any? And he said, no, this is all I brought. And uh, I looked at it. He just had a manila envelope in hand. And I said, well, what do you have there, your songs? And he said, no, I have this for you. And he pulled out articles about Shecky Green and Maury Amsterdam from the Las Vegas newspaper. And, uh, you know, I looked at this, and of course I was impressed by this, you know. Um, but I was surprised that he traveled that light. <laughs> did tell me that uh, his favorite musical act was Hamilton, Joe, Frank, and Reynolds. We had some interesting comments from the bartender at the Palomino, or one of the employees, and uh, he gave us our money and gave me a good, long, hard look, you know, cause one of those looks, very judgmental look. First thing he says to me is, are you related to him? I said, no, I'm not. I just play guitar. And then he said, that is the worst shit I have ever heard in my life. Here's your money. And I, I didn't feel like, you know, debating the point with him, you know, then. But I feel he was wrong. I, I mean, I think there's a lot worse shit than the ledge. I wrote a letter to John Glenn, asked him if he would uh, uh, ask NASA if they would uh, rename the moon after him. Be that body of rock be named John Glenn because it orbits the Earth, and he was the first American to orbit the Earth. He wrote me a letter back and said, uh, it will always be known as the moon, but thank you for your interest anyway. Nobody that can really can really outdo him and and that whole thing. I, I I almost look at it as as kind of being the closest uh, maybe maybe that he's actually a jazz musician. You know that that because West Texas really doesn't have the influences like New York and Chicago and you know where you hear a lot of other jazz players. But but it's complete kind of improvising. I always kind of think of him as maybe. West Texas' greatest jazz musician. Sooner or later, 
for being orbit like me. I'm going to rocket two stars up. I'm going to shoot to number one. I'm going to rocket two stars now to get higher than the sun. Well, Venus and Mars can't be too far because I'm a high flying son of a gun. I'm going to rocket two stars up. I'm going to shoot to number one. I've got the fuel to fly across the sky, and it'll be a heck of a ride. The man in the moon will sing my tunes, and together we'll turn the tide. Cause I'm a space tripper, a real big dipper, a shooting star with moonbeams in a jar. I'm gonna rocket two star jump, I'm gonna shoot to number one. I'm gonna rocket two star jump, I'm gonna shoot to number one. I'm gonna rocket two star jump, I'm gonna get higher than the sun. Well, Venus and Mars can't be too far, cause I'm a high flying son of a gun. I'm gonna rocket two star jump, I'm gonna shoot to number one. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the legendary Stardust Cowboy talking to you tonight, and I've got some good news to tell you. I've got music critics and record reviewers the world over. They've written about me in magazines and publications and newspapers the world over that I can't sing, that I can't play the guitar, that I don't know how to carry a tune. Well, I've got good news for you fine people out here tonight. Neither can Kenny Rogers nor Mick Jagger, so all of us rascals are in the same boat. Day one of our vacation, and here we are entering Texas. You that party. That's a lie, Jerry Jr. It really stinks. That's a lie, Keep son. Keep your eyes. Bendejo. Show your putters. Okay, I gotta get in there. Let's see. Oh, great, sir. Yeah. Sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Hello. Would you mind filming me and my family? Oh, there you go. Sure. <laughs> Just a little. Okay. Texas. Right over here. Come on. <laughs> this way. This way. Hello. Okay, good. Right over here. Okay. Remember, this is vacation. Turn right around oh, there, Junior. Oh, sir. Warm. Sir, I'll thank you to get your derelict hands off my wife. All right? Fuck face! My face! My face! This is great. My word, what is that? Where'd he go? I don't know about this. Well, it does say family style. Big, 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 you did know this. Big, big, big. I don't care for that music. I don't know. Maybe we should have waited for Arby's. What on earth? <laughs>